Welcome. Today we're going to talk about Cal Newport's latest book, Slow Productivity. This is his fifth entry into the, and I guess what I consider the adult productivity space. A bunch of his other books were for students first. So let's dive in and see if this is worthwhile for you to read. My first entry into Newport was with Deep Work, which I wrote two extensive posts on. I think one's like 6,000 words, and I really liked it. It felt like at the time it was saying everything that I was thinking but didn't know how to say at the moment. Now, since then, I've read his other books, and I have not been as enamored. They haven't been bad, but they've just been okay. This book, Sold Productivity, is based on three tenets. First, do fewer things. Second, work at a natural pace. Third, obsess over the quality of the work you do. He contrasts these three ideas with the thought um, that we currently have a faulty definition of productivity consisting of just doing more things faster and using more time to do work. Newport also introduces pseudo productivity, at least as far as I can tell. I do wonder if he introduced this in um, a world without email as well, but I couldn't find it in my notes and I did not reread the whole book for this. So pseudo productivity Newport defines as doing visible action like chats, emails, button seat times so people can see you doing, doing something as a proxy for actual effort. It's hard to measure effort. It's hard to measure the product of things uh, in a knowledge work environment. And because it's harder to measure anything that you actually do in a knowledge work environment, you just look at the emails you send and that's good enough. Let's dive into his first tenant, do fewer things. On page 53, he defines it as strive to reduce your obligations to the point where you can easily imagine accomplishing them with time to spare. Leverage this reduced load to more fully embrace and advance the small number of projects that matter most. So do less. And it really points out that any project that you do uh, decide to take on has extra overhead, right? In the form of email to organize it, tasks, just like extra stuff that's outside of the specific project doing the work. Now, this is also where I start to have exceptions uh, or issues with productivity books. And he highlights the Achilles heel of every productivity book I've read recently, where it assumes you have autonomy over your work. And he really only makes a passing reference to those that may not. And that's about it. He says, oh, you might not, though. And it's going to be harder if you don't. Now, he certainly never steps into the economic arguments for like how our system is designed. And this is just faulty that most people will not have autonomy and you're going to have a bad boss. And what do you do about that? Uh, and that if you don't, if you do fewer things, if you don't just do what your boss says, you'll be out of a job and then you can't have a house and you can't eat. So he really never addresses that. So after a statement about committing to doing less, he really has some generic productivity advice, asking your boss to remove things if things were added to your list. That's actually something I used effectively in my first job. My boss would come up to me with some new all-fired idea, and I'd be like, okay, great, what don't I have to do today? And he'd almost always say, oh, never mind, just don't do the thing I said. But most people aren't going to be able to do that. And Newport never really addresses that. The second tenet is work at a natural pace. Newport defines this on page 116 as don't rush your most important work. Allow it instead to unfold along a sustainable timeline with variations in intensity and in settings conducive to brilliance. Now, this natural pace that he wants you to take on would have you measure your productivity not over days or weeks, but like months even or years, better even decades, right? He cites a bunch of like scientists who, when you look at their life, you're like, they did so much. But then you look like they took like a year off to go like, goof around they took every summer to like go hang out at the cottage stuff like that um and it'd be great again it'd be great if your boss would actually let you do that say oh wait over the last 10 years have been super productive but they don't care they care about the last project they care about like this week last week last month that's all they care about so again he never addresses the economic system that has put us in this position where you are measured by the week by the day um by the last project only and not based on what you've done for the last 10 years and saying hey you're a good employee like you're we're in a slow pit and that's fine but you know you've been productive over the last 10 years it sounds super idyllic to be able to take these long breaks that newport suggests so that you can learn and then combine or he talks about a bunch of scientists who like come up with an idea and they spend like years doing other stuff and they keep coming back to this idea and coming back to it and they take breaks from it and they finally have their breakthrough that they're known for that makes them everyone think that they're like a massive um, productivity person they did so much in their life but all the examples he uses has wealth of some fashion, just didn't need a job, like could have done whatever they wanted, basically. And he never addresses uh, this more than just a passing reference of, oh, they're wealthy, and it's a hard thing to do. Now, he also brings up the current buzzword of quiet quitting, but not in the same way that I've seen. So as I've understand it, it's, you show up and do your job, you work from nine to five, and that's it. You just do your job. You're not available otherwise. And Newport says, well, you know, sometimes you should be quiet quitting and you should be like, you're not quite just doing a little bit extra, not as much, right? Shutting down your phone a little more often, stuff like that. But the rest of the time, you should be like in there all the time and like just being around all the time. 
so ultimately he's really advocating for a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work, um, uh, more work than you're being paid for, but only sometimes. And the rest of the time you're only doing a little tiny bit of work more than you paid for. Again, just again, falling into the productivity hustle culture mindset, even though he tries to say he's not because he's the deep work, the slow guy, but it doesn't really seem like it when you look at his arguments. Now, his final point is obsess over quality. It's page 173 defined as obsess over the quality of what you produce, even if this means missing opportunities in the short term. Leverage the value of these results to gain more freedom in your efforts over the long term. So in short, this is the advice from So Good They Can't Ignore You. Do good work, do such good work that people recognize you and then leverage that not into more money necessarily, but to more autonomy over your work. So his first example is Jewel, who did some uh, albums for the labels and then decided, hey, I'm going to do like albums that don't cost a lot to do. And so it'll keep me on because it doesn't like cost them a lot. But by her own admission, that by that time she made that decision, she didn't need any more money. So not a great example because, you know, I need more money. Do you need more money? So I don't know how we're supposed to follow this. I don't need more money and I'll do what I want thing. His second example is Paul Jarvis, who disclaimer, I've done a little bit of work for in the past. Um, it's better because Jarvis says, hey, you know, you just don't need so much stuff. You just cut back, live a smaller life and then do what you want to do because you have more freedom. That's better. But it's again, that's like the one example I thought was reasonable, at least. The rest of his examples really rely on survivorship bias, right? He's like, oh, Bill Gates dropped out and he did great. Like all these people that are like, how many other people dropped out and didn't do great? He does make a passing reference to, you know, for every John Grisham and Clive Cussler who, you know, didn't, who went on to like become great authors, there are lots of people who failed. But that's it. He says you should only quit when you see economic benefit. And, but that's really it. This is like a throwaway, like short couple paragraphs in like a whole book of, hey, you should just like dedicate to yourself and do your thing and you, sh you need to focus on you and that's the important thing. Uh, and he doesn't really seriously engage with like any of the economic factors that make it impossible for most people to be able to do this. So finally, should you read slow productivity? As I read more productivity books um, by anyone at this moment, really, maybe with the exception of 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman, I can't help but see that most of them fall firmly into uh, agreement about our economic system is like perfect and this is how we should do things and that it's your fault. And this is ultimately what capitalism and business wants you to think. When you don't succeed, it's your fault because you didn't do the work. It has nothing to do with poverty or lack of walkable cities or anything like this. Nothing with the structure that's around you. Uh, it has everything to do with your choices. And Newport just sticks with the script of all productivity authors in this. It is your fault. You need to do the work. And there's barely passing reference to, you know, any external factors that may affect and may make it so you can't um, win. That you can't, you can't, like you literally can't because that's how the factors are set up for you. <clears throat> so ultimately, should you read it if you're new to the productivity space? And it's a decent book. It's not bad. Um, I think it misses again some core arguments, like I said, about the economic factors that we live in. <sighs> but again, who who does this? Like who's the market for this? It's honestly probably a bunch of white people <laughs> that have some affluence already and can take the time to read. Uh, so it's not anyone who probably has to deal with many of these economic factors that make it impossible um, to succeed. So again, productivity book, if you're looking to get started in them, not a bad book, not the best, just it's fine. It's a fine book. Uh, I still have a soft spot for Newport because of deep work because I read it twice. Maybe I should read it again though and see if it's actually worthwhile. That's it. If you like the video, thumbs up below. If you love it, subscribe, hit the bell, all that YouTube stuff. If you want to see all my book notes, you can go to chrismichael.ca slash membership and members get access to all of the raw book notes I take for all of my books. Have an awesome day.